Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're overclocking the Ryzen 3 2200G to the max with a $20 air cooler from Deepcool called the Gamax 200T. Though I should note this video is in no way, shape or form sponsored by Deepcool, they just so happen to have a cheap cooler on offer that I could quickly buy locally. Now I said $20 cooler, but it can often be found selling for less than that. In fact, as I prepared this video, it was selling on Amazon for just $13 US, and that's actually up from $9 the previous week. For my fellow Australians, you can get this cooler for as little as $20 Aussie, and in fact, the slightly more extreme Gamax 300 can be had for just $25 over at PC Case Gear. I've actually now picked up both models, but for today's video, I will be focusing on the slightly cheaper Gamax 200, so I can show you exactly how it performs on the Ryzen 3 2200G. You might think investing around $20 in an aftermarket cooler for a Raven Ridge APU is a little odd, especially for the 2200G given that the APU itself costs just $100. It is true for maximum value, you will want to stick with the Wraith Stealth Box Cooler. Uh, this little guy allows for a mild overclock of either the CPU or GPU, and we showed that in our launch day coverage. Using the box cooler, I was able to push the Vega 8 GPU from the default 1.1 GHz right up to 1.6 GHz. And while this did lead to some very nice gains, it did also push operating temperatures well into the 80s. And for this reason, I wasn't able to overclock the CPU cores as well. Our overclock, which saw a 45% increase in GPU frequency, often net us around 20 to 30% more frames in games. And this really transformed the affordable Ryzen 3 2200G. And well, this got me thinking. If you're upgrading an old PC, you will require not just the 2200G, but also an AM4 motherboard, and my preference would be a decent quality B350 model, and they typically cost around $70 US. There's also a good chance you will need some DDR4 memory and a dual channel DDR4 3000 kit like the one I have here. They generally cost about $100. So this means the total bill will come out at around $270 US, which really is exceptional given that you also get the reasonably capable Vega 8 GPU as well. Considering we saw at least a 20% uplift in games from just the GPU overclock, I was keen to see what the 2200G could offer with an even more aggressive overclock applied to the GPU, along with an overclock of the CPU cores as well. In the case of the Deepcool Gamax 200T and 300, at around $20 they increased the total build cost by just 7%. So if they can keep the Ryzen 3 2200G cool and quiet when overclocked and allow for gains of at least 20%, then it seems you're very much getting a solid return on investment. Now, if you're new to all this overclocking business or you've just been on the fence because it all sounds a bit too scary, I'd urge you to have a go. It's actually very easy and safe to get good results. Typically, I encourage overclocking via the BIOS, but AMD's Ryzen Master software is actually quite good, and for beginners, it's actually very user-friendly. In fact, I can quickly show you where to start right now. First step would be to acquire the Ryzen Master software and install it. I'll provide a link in the video description. Then once installed, open it up and you'll be faced with, well, this. It looks a little bit overwhelming, but just relax. Most of this you can ignore for our overclock. Click on the game mode tab at the bottom of the window. Alternatively, you can use profile one or two, and if you want to rename those, you just have to double click on them. Anyway, once you've selected one of these tabs, we can start with either the CPU or GPU overclocking. I suggest finding the maximum stable frequency of one of these and then moving on to the other. For the CPU frequency, simply raise the frequency from 3,500 megahertz to 3,700 megahertz or 3.7 gigahertz, and then run a stress test with a program like Prime95 or A64 for about 30 minutes, and that'll give you a rough idea of how stable the system is. If it doesn't crash, then proceed to 3.8 gigahertz, run the stress test again, and if you pass, then you can move on on to 3.9 gigahertz and so on. I expect that most of you will probably land around 3.8 to 3.9 gigahertz. Also be aware that you can do this in much smaller steps than what I've done it in. I'm quite impatient when it comes to overclocking, so I've just done it in 100 megahertz leaps, but you can do it as small as 25 increments if you prefer. But as I said, most 2200G chips should be good for around 3.8 to 3.9 gigahertz. While you're increasing the CPU core frequency, you'll also want to increase the CPU voltage. That said though, the Ryzen Master software does default to 1.4 volts for some reason, and this is already very high. I wouldn't recommend you push much higher for 24-7 use. In fact, you could try and dial this back a bit. Somewhere between 1.3 and 1.4 volts is likely where you'll end up. Once the CPU overclock has been applied, you'll next want to work out the maximum GPU frequency. By default, the Vega 8 GPU and the 2200G operates at 1.1 GHz, but the Ryzen Master software defaults to just 400 MHz, which is a bit odd. 
Without any voltage adjustments, you should be able to push this up to around 1.3 gigahertz. In order to go higher, you will need to increase the APU graphics voltage and the SOC voltage. By default, both are set at 1.1 volts, but for best results, I bumped the APU graphics voltage up to 1.3 volts and the SOC voltage to 1.2 volts. The SOC voltage is particularly important as this is a single rail that feeds the Uncore and graphics domains. I found that 1.2 volts was enough to stabilize the Vega 8 GPU at 1650 MHz, but I've also seen reports of users going as high as 1.25 volts, and this is the maximum voltage AMD recommends. For testing the GPU overclock, free tools such as the Superposition Benchmark work well. With the GPU, you can increase the frequency by 1 MHz at a time, but that would be painstakingly slow. You should be able to jump right up to 1300 MHz and then continue from there in small adjustments and also adjust the voltage as you go. Once you have everything set up and saved to the profile of your choosing, you simply have to open the Ryzen Master software every time you start the system and apply the profile. Alternatively though, you can take note of all these settings and then load into the BIOS and simply apply them there. And that way they will be automatically applied every time the system boots up. So what has my overclock done for the 2200G and how well does the Gamax 200 look after it? Before we get to the gaming frame rate results, here's a look at the temperatures starting with F1 2017. Each pass lasts six minutes and I ran the test half a dozen times and here's the results for the final run. Whereas the race stealth was pushing into the high 80s with just the GPU overclocked, the Gamax 200T never saw temperatures rise above 55 degrees, which is remarkable. Oh, and please note I maintained an ambient room temperature of 21 degrees for all this testing. Not only that, but the fan wasn't really spinning particularly fast and I'd describe it as almost silent. Also, for those wondering, this is 1080p footage featuring the medium quality preset with TAA enabled. That's pretty impressive stuff given we saw an average of 47 FPS with a minimum of 39 FPS, and the frame time data was also very respectable. In fact, frame consistency was also excellent in this title, and while AMD does have their work cut out for them in other titles, it's great to see we have a few examples where the Raven Ridge APUs are silky smooth. Before moving on, I ran an hour-long Overwatch bot match, and the way I configure this means that the game never actually ends, so it makes for a great stress test. Again, temperatures stayed under 55 degrees for both the CPU and GPU. It was also great to see silky smooth frame rate performance in this tile, and here I was again using the medium quality preset at 1080p with 100% render scale set. Okay, so temperatures were excellent, and the Gamax 200T was very quiet, so now it's time to see what kind of frame rate gains gamers can expect to see. Since we just looked at Overwatch in our stress test, let's now check out the gameplay results. Here we see a 19% increase for the average frame rate and 23% for the minimum frame rate when overclocking the 2200G. That's a decent performance uplift and it meant the 2200G was now not only faster than the stock 2400G, but also quite a bit faster than the Pentium G4560 and GT1030 combo when looking at the minimum result. Moving on to CSGO, we see a 22% increase for the average frame rate, but a massive 45% boost to the minimum result. This is very likely a result of overclocking not just the GPU, but also the CPU. Next up, we have Dota 2, and here we see a 21% increase for the average, but only a 13% increase for the minimum, which is quite surprising. Still, these are decent gains nonetheless. The Fortnite Battle Royale results are interesting and not just because we see massive gains when overclocking. Stock the 2200G seemed somewhat constrained as the minimum and average frame rates were very close, much like what we see with the Intel CPUs using their horrible integrated graphics. Overclocking the GPU seems to alleviate this issue and we see a massive 45% increase in average frame rate with a 34% boost to the minimum. And this means that the 2200G is now able to match the 2400G, or at least the stock 2400G. Of course, I just had to test PUBG, even though it's really no friend of AMD hardware, or certainly the AMD APUs. Still, overclocking really helped here, and we did see a 25% boost, and that was very noticeable when actually playing the game. Testing with Rainbow Six Siege saw a 21% boost to the average frame rate and 25% increase for the minimum. So this is in line with what we've seen from most of the other titles that have been tested so far. Finally, we have Rocket League, and here we see our worst result yet, just a 16% boost once overclocked. Not a bad result, and it did allow the 2200G to overtake the stock 2400G and almost catch the Pentium G4560 and GT1030 combo. 
Overall, for less than $300, that's really a killer combo. When you consider that a Core i3-8100 on a yet-to-be-released B360 motherboard with 8GB of DDR4 memory, and of course a GT1030 graphics card, that sort of combo you'd be looking at around $370. And that means you'd be saving 20-something percent by getting the Raven Ridge APU, and that kind of saving will no doubt be very welcomed by budget shoppers. I'd say worst case scenario, you'd still be able to extract at least 10 to 15% more out of this APU with a basic air cooler. So to me, that seems well worth the investment. Not to mention tinkering with these APUs is just a whole heap of fun. In fact, I've found it quite a bit more rewarding than playing around with say an 8700K and a GTX 1080 Ti, though I'm not trying to kid anyone, that's also a boatload of fun. Anyway, that's going to do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit the like button for us, subscribe for more content, and if you appreciate the testing and all the work we do here at Harbour Unbox, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.